All right. I didn't originally start with TNG season one when I was doing this video series, but I figured I really should go back and do season one because I didn't start doing individual videos of specific episodes until season two. So time to go back and do all of season one. Here we have Encounter at Five, the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And since Star Trek The Next Generation didn't have an, a movie to introduce it, they instead made a two-part episode that is almost the length of a feature film. However, it's structured a bit differently than you would expect for a feature film. And since it's a double-length episode, it's um, got a lot of stuff in it. Most notable, however, is, of course, the fact that uh, it is there to introduce the cast of The Next Generation. Because this is an entirely new group and so on and so forth and that is much like you know the obligatory first session of a ttrpg where the characters get put together and don't really know exactly what's going on and who is and what and so on and so forth Now, um, that said, there are actually several aspects of this that literally never get come up again. And that's something I personally found to be rather interesting. It's like, it, it's almost as if certain of the specific details about the cast members that got tossed into this one were things that the later writers just forgot about. But, um, for the most part, it's a starting adventure where everyone gets together and does a new thing. Now, the episode has a split focus in terms of action. Because the B-plot for this is actually just all of the crew getting introduced and doing stuff. Because, again, it's a whole bunch of crew. Now, some of these are, are minor characters that actually never uh, get seen very little. Although, in the way it's presented in the first episode, it's actually kind of hard to be sure which of them are and which aren't. But, like this guy. He's literally only one in one episode. Um, if he looks like he's someone you may have seen in more than one episode, well... Actually, he hasn't done much in Star Trek either. Anyway, though. So, Q doing Q stuff for the first time ever. That, it sets up the tone for TNG, though. Because, for some reason, Q fathers the cast of TNG quite a lot. It also is like the whole, like, humanity being on trial thing. That's part of this episode. Why exactly Q is focusing on humans in particular? That's an interesting question. And that's a question that doesn't actually ever get answered. Not even when they do that Q is dying idiot plot in Star Trek Picard did they actually answer why it was that Q, in the beginning of TNG, decided he wanted to put humans on trial for being barbaric and savage. What is it about humans that gives them special treatment over all of the other races in the universe? Because he apparently doesn't do that to any other race, and I don't understand why. 
other things that are interesting that uh, you rarely see later. Deanna Troy wearing an actual medical uniform. But, yeah, that doesn't come up with much later. The, the writers uh, came up with an excuse to have her uh, not wear uh, regular uniforms and had her dress in whatever. And there's, um, you know, whatever this thing is. This is just one of those weird things where Q is doing Q things for Q reasons and none of it actually makes sense. And after they get done with the Q idiocy for a while, anyways, um, they get to Deneb 4 and talk to the Bandi about the thing that they had been promised. Like, here's another interesting thing. Riker arrived at Deneb 4 on board the USS Hood. And then um, meets the rest of the crew of the USS Enterprise at Farpoint Station. And uh, Beverly Crusher and Wesley uh, also um, met at Farpoint Station waiting for the Enterprise to uh, pick them up. This is something that's an, an interesting plot point that gets uh, uh, forgotten about very quickly, though, is that at the beginning of TNG, Riker and Crusher were not uh, a, um, long-standing members of the crew. They were, they, had, as of the first episode of TNG, they were freshly assigned to the ship, which, of course, would give you a reason to have the other crew members treat them as new guys. Although, in the case of Deanna Troy, she's like, oh, hide person that I know quite well when talking to Riker. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, the whole thing with Wesley is, um, strange. Because Wesley is Jack Crusher's son. He's not Picard's son. However, uh, it gets weird. Yeah, also, this is another thing that gets screwball, is that because they did a saucer separation, part of the ship shows up at uh, Den uh, Deneb before the rest of it does. And then they have to reattach it. Yeah. You know, you would think that uh, reattaching will be relatively easy when you can do stuff like having uh, tractor beams to uh, line it up or something. And, of course, Admiral McCoy. Yes, that McCoy. Showed up for a cameo. Um... Because they could. They actually did have several TOS cast do cameos in TNG. But um, some of them... Well, what's the, what's the best way to put this? Most of them were relatively early on. And are... Uh, Played by actors that are now deceased. Like, um, DeForest Kelly died in 99. Encounter at Farpoint was from, let's see here, 1987. So, it was aired approximately 12 years before he died, but it's pretty obvious from, from when it was aired, that he his health was 
not so good. I mean, still good enough that he could do acting roles, but um, acting part of a uh, old man who is um, getting a bit feeble. Anyway, though. So, uh, McCoy t uh, talking to Data about Data being an android was actually a pretty interesting scene, though, simply because of the fact that um, McCoy knows what androids are because of the fact that he was in the episode Mud Splinter. And he also had to deal with the old one androids created on XO3. So McCoy knows a lot of things about androids. Notably, those androids were more human-like than Data. But, you know. So it's actually understandable that McCoy would be like, oh, you're an android, not a weird alien. Oh, I see. <laughs> In theory, Data could simply change the color of his own skin if he wanted to. He just doesn't bother. Because he just sees it as part of who he is. And also, we have the whole thing of um, Deanna doing uh, psionic uh, snooping and um, identifying problems due to psionic snooping. Like one. See, the Zorn guy who Riker was talking to earlier, um, okay, in Farpoint Station. Farpoint Station is a living thing that the uh, Bandi somehow managed to coerce into acting as a trading outpost. Why the Bandi did this instead of just building a trading outpost, I have no idea. How they did this is also unknown. But they did. And that means that the um, trading outpost isn't something that they can actually do as a proper reproducible product. And that's something that I personally have to have to, to scratch my head about. It's like, so how, how many of these were the Bandy planning on trying to sell to the Federation when they only actually have the one? I don't really get that. Hmm. Anyway, so. Another thing that's interesting is that uh, because of the fact that this is the first episode uh, where Riker meets uh, Picard, who was the acting first officer? I'm genuinely not sure about that one. I would literally have to rewatch the episode and scrutinize it because I yeah, it's really not giving me a, a good idea here. It's because like uh, they didn't have a different first officer. They just, if I remember right, they just didn't have a uh, a person sitting in the first officer's seat when they started out. Because, okay, it's two of the most important crew on the ship. But, even so, you don't really need them for every single moment of every day. However, you know, Chief Medical Officer... Actually, like, for Chief Medical Officer, it's not entirely clear whether Dr. Sealar was uh, aboard at this time. They literally talk about Dr. Sealar so little that they, uh, that for, for most episodes, she might as well not exist. But 
when they do mention Dr. Selar, they mention that she is the second highest ranking medical officer on the ship. So, you know, maybe Selar was actually uh, acting as the, the uh, CMO at the time. We don't know. Anyway, though, so for players uh, acting out all of this stuff, yeah, it's really, really simple in the terms of like, having a new group meet up and do stuff. Hmm. Well, see, also, it's, what is kind of interesting is having uh, the chief of Starfleet Medical uh, go to uh, the uh, Federation flagship as part of, you know, whatever. Hey, that works. Do, do, do. Anyway, though, um, one thing that's also interesting is that uh, shots of the way Data's skin is uh, colored are a little different than they are in later episodes. This is something that you'll notice is that the TNG episode um, props in episode one are a little off. Everything in this just looks off compared to later TNG. And that's because they literally rebuilt all of it. They created new uniforms that were more comfortable for the actors to wear that don't look the same, and so on and so forth. And yeah, Data's makeup is but slightly different. Anyway, though, the Nidarian life forms are something that's interesting because having someone like Deanna Troy to communicate with them certainly helps quite a lot and i really am not certain i would want to fight that thing because it's huge also there's two of them in this episode and having two of them uh, going at you is even worse than having one yeah Oh, I see. Uh, it says here that the Bandi were controlling the amount of energy the uh, Nidarian life form uh, received in order to force it to do what they wanted. Okay, that makes sense. Of course, the Nidarian life form is, um, you know, uh, Let's just say that the other Nidarians are unhappy about this. We only actually see a second one, but still. Um, and of course, Q is like, oh no, how, how could you possibly uh, uh, solve this uh, incredibly uh, fascinating enigma? And then leave. Really, Q? You actually thought people weren't going to solve that? Press X to die. Hmm. Anyways, though, um, again, we there's very little we know about Deneb and the Bandi. And uh, also, the whole thing with uh, Zorn, um, yeah, the Nidarian life form, um, yeah, it's really, really pissed at him. Yeah, Troy, uh, reading the minds of the Nidarians is a massive it, it, a plot critical thing, actually, because no one else on there on it was able to figure it out. Like in theory, if you spent enough time scanning everything in scanning range, you might have noticed. And that's something. This is actually something else that's an interesting plot point. Is that the Nadarian uh, that arrives in orbit starts shooting up the thing on the planet surface. It's actually a bandy uh, architecture because Farpoint Station is a Nidarian life form. This is not. And when the second one shows up in orbit, it starts shooting holes in that.
And that's where this gets rather interesting, is that how many of the Bandi actually survive this? We don't know. Exact numbers. But we do have reason to not, you know, like them or trust them or, and stuff. So, so you know, using the Bandi in a uh, episode, you know, um, a race that is willing to negotiate with the Federation and trade with the Federation, not necessarily trustworthy, though. Hmm. You could definitely have fun with that. Whether you use the Farpoint Station plot or not is, um, you know, up to you. But um, the ideas that you could go with this are pretty cool. Also, the veil thing. You wouldn't necessarily need to have all of the Bandi do that. Oh, also, this was a DC Fontana episode. <laughs> Uh, wait, no. Oh, wait, no, no, no. That, that That's a, uh, a follow-up written by DC Fontana. Still, though. Um, he actually did write the, the uh, episode itself. Oh, no, this is a DC Fontana episode. Never mind. <laughs> DC Fontana and Gene Roddenberry. Dorothy Fontana did a lot of, of work in... TOS and THJ. And mm, really one of the writers who uh, made Star Trek what it is. This episode, you know, the, the big key thing is realizing that shooting the bad guys isn't going to help. Yeah. That was the, the, the part of, uh, of this, that was the, the whole big thing is that uh, the Bandi are actually the bad guys, but shooting them isn't what you need to do in order to uh, fix the problem. Freeing the Nidarian from their control is what was needed to fix the problem, and quite frankly, I still have no idea how it was they were able to force the thing to do what they wanted in the first place. Also, could they have managed to convince one of the Nidarians to do this as so, some sort of a um, mutually beneficial agreement and not, you know, forcing it to do so. Hmm. We'll see, huh? That is something you could actually play with, though, is that if you, as a person running a TTRPG, wanted to use Nidarians in the story, you could just have them as friendly allies. Yes, they are highly powerful beings, but they're not exactly, you know, omnipotent, if you know what I mean. This thing, as big and scary looking as it is, needed the Enterprise's help to free its um, friend from the Bondi. And although it did kill a whole lot of Bondi in the front, you know, trying to uh, convince the Bondi to let, let its friend go. At any rate, I think that's all I have for now. This is a sort of episode that the basic gist of it being an introductory to the entirety of TNG. Well, several of the things that TNG became most known for in late TNG aren't here. They haven't been introduced yet. Some of the interesting ideas that are cool, uh, things that are TNG is famous for are introduced, though, like Data being an android. Uh, having this ship that can do saucer separation and stuff like that. Those are things that get introduced and are seen later and used quite heavily later. But not everything that they get introduced here actually comes up later. And there's a whole bunch of things that get added e even later to it. Like what? Um... Deanna wearing this gold braid thing. She does wear um, hair pieces uh, a lot. This specific one, eh, not so much. At any rate, though, I think that's enough about that. 
lots you can do with this, but actually, that's another thing about this that's interesting, and it's something that's probably a, a plot hole that you should avoid. Riker and Data are um, discussing the holodeck as if it is something brand new, but no, it's not. Anyways. Oh, also, uh, the uh, Shut Up Wesley meme begins. Because, I mean, they, they have to introduce Wesley in this episode, and thus they have to introduce Wesley as being someone that you want to tell to shut up. Uh, now, this is actually something that's interesting, though, is that um, Wesley at, falls in the water, and then it has water dripping off of him uh, later, which... By standard holodeck rules, shouldn't work. Although, it is possible that the holodeck did, in fact, involve using replicators to synthesize a quantity of water for... Because, realistically, a energy field wouldn't feel wet, I guess is one way to put it. This is actually something with the holodecks that is interesting, is that it's not just energy fields some of the time. And that's actually something that you might want to uh, take into consideration if you're using holodecks as part of a plot, is that this is something that actually came up in Voyager, is that, oh, it's a, uh, it's a meal in the holodeck. Oh, sure, I will sit down and eat your meal. Yeah, it's replicated food. So it's, you know, um, actual food to a certain extent. Not just, you know, um, energy in the shape of food. Very important difference. Especially if you're worried that someone's giving you poison food. Alrighty, uh, I'm going to call that. See you guys next time.